So I wanted to emphasize the action, the in-ring competition, the storylines involving contention for championships and personal issues, and the wrestlers' unique personalities, a combination, this is quoting, of the aura of real sport, credible action, and competitive drama as seen in today's Ultimate Fighting Championship with stars in the age group of most of the viewers in Ring of Honor, not the -the over-the-hill gang in TNA or the established play wrestlers in the WWE. This is more serious. This is cooler. This is younger. And I know a lot of people out there are going to say, well, then why didn't he want the young wrestlers to do all the shit? Because there's (laughs) another side of that coin. A lot of the young wrestlers look like fucking kids. And besides the, the fact that Ring of Honor had, in my opinion, and I've not been a secret about this, been using local guys and indie guys that look to outlaw to be on a major league television production. Um, and I'm saying there was somebody on the internet, 200 people you know, on the internet in fucking 2010 saying the Super Smash Brothers were the greatest tag team in wrestling. But, you know, I'm sorry. Look at if you could see them on Raw something wrong with you. I wasn't going to put anybody in the ring or tried not to that. Once again, these executives or potential sponsors with regional soft drink bottling companies or our fast food franchises are going to look at the pro- program and say, who are these kids playing wrestler on my TV? Who are these outlaw looking? They wouldn't say that, but you know, job guys, why is this man dropping this woman on her head? We, we, we needed to get away. I mean, we need to get away from heavy bloods at the house shows and on the DVDs was one thing, but we, we had to ask Joe, I think about six months in after they'd already debuted the TV, if we could put a little blood on television, uh, we couldn't have serious injuries from lots of fucking furniture and, and stunts. So when the guys would try to dive out of the balcony or whatever the fuck it, it once again, it, it, it was it was wonderful for some of the wrestling fans, but they were not obviously numerous enough to keep Kerry Silken from going under with Ring of Honor. So to find someone who had the money to take this to the next level, you had to make concessions in terms of the programming of shit that wasn't necessary anyway. Because those guys were performing at a high level. I remember I said Davey Richards and, and Tyler Black, Seth Rollins, was my... 2000s version of Flair and Steamboat, that pay, internet pay-per-view show we had in Toronto in, I believe, 2010. Yeah. And uh, it, if that wasn't going to sell a television network and if that kind of action wasn't good enough for the wrestling fans, they had to see the guys in pajamas doing flips and playing with fucking stuffed animals. Grizzly then Redwood. Fuck, and, 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 or Grizzly Redwood. I'm sorry. He was a nice kid. That's why I always supported him being on the ring crew or having jobs do around the, but Grizzly Redwood, 5'2 and 140 pounds with a fucking Redwood outfit on next to Tyler Black. It, it, you can't have a schizophrenic promotion. I, I, the people will say, well, that's just the, the, you know, the comedy match. No, we didn't want comedy matches because we wanted more than the fans to take this seriously. At any rate, um, on that same show in Toronto, I don't often say this a lot, but the Kings of Wrestling, Claudio Casignoli, Cesaro, and Chris Hero, and the Briscoes had a match that was incredible. It was an old-fashioned, southern-style grudge match. I helped them lay it out and gave them some spots or permission to do some things. It involved blood and tying ropes around people's necks and shooting people with fire extinguishers and shit. But it it tore the fucking house down um, in a completely different style. And if those two matches were in that Madison Square Garden show next April, people would say that those were the two greatest matches they've ever seen in a wrestling ring. It's because it's they were great matches and also part of it is placement. But that's that's the kind of stuff that we were trying to sell. And I didn't want to go with the comedy bullshit that made us look outlaw or shoestring or low budget any more than what we were doing already did because we had to get people interested. And I'm not talking about the, the fans interested. They, they hopefully were already interested. Um, and, and at, at any rate, then the Sinclair talks went on for quite a while from that original proposal, which was basically shoot a show and put us on your air and, and sell it. And I went into a detail on how local and regional wrestling on television could be sold. Uh, that each local station would retain half the commercial inventory and Ring of Honor would get the rest to promote their live events and markets, which then we would turn around and make commercial buys with the stations for when we ran them. So it was in 
not only did would Sinclair have an inventory of commercial time in the programs to sell t- for their own local sponsors, but we would have commercial time promoting live events that we would run in the market that they would help us promote not only with the television show on their air, but also with their contacts, and that in return we would buy a schedule for – and that they had an interest in seeing that we had more people and potentially even like in some of the bigger markets, as used to be done in the old days. Uh, you run an advertising schedule for us for nothing, but we'll give you points in the town. So four times a year when we come to Chicago, you get a payoff, but help us promote it, that type of thing in much more verbose language. Um, I gave them a list of advertisers that are typically easier to sell for pro wrestling, pizza delivery. New and used car dealers, sports bars, appliance and furniture rental, check cashing, pawn shops, fast food outlets, amusement parks, arcades, go-kart tracks, uh, and how packages could be combined with personal appearances from the stars that could be cross-promoted over these platforms, and how you can tie radio stations, which is sometimes a dirty word in television, but you could tie radio stations into the live events to create uh, an event event. Um a live event schedule, how that it could possibly be done, especially with clusters of their stations being in classic wrestling markets like Ohio and the Carolinas. Um, broke down uh, uh, how live event gates could be distributed to talent and to the uh, the various promotional partners and talked about the internet pay-per-view and how with a broadcast group with finances behind us, to upgrade professional television production equipment and broadcast equipment and then uh, upgrading the website platform that we had and doing it all in-house, there could be a tremendous extra market revenue off streaming these live events off the Internet. Imagine that, me, the most technologically logically fucking challenged motherfucker, but this wasn't hard to figure out, and it was cheap to do back then until – you know, the Internet pay- – Ring of Honor helped the Internet pay-per-view business go under pretty much as, as a major thing by all of our fits and starts. But that was – the whole idea is to do it right from, from almost the start. At any rate, and, and that, that proposal and then also there was international television sales because if you are producing a program for your domestic markets and monetizing it that way, you've still got the rest of the world – that the more money you put into that program, the more money you're going to be able to ask for it overseas, which is looking for programming that rivals or challenges the WWE programming, and it has to look good. It can't just be the hometown shit. And then the, the talent that Ring of Honor had under contract that was already really the best of the rest and the fact that independent money – Almost 10 years ago, you when if you were Ring of Honor and you could guarantee guys 30 dates a year, the top guys, you were getting guys for between $200 and $500 a night and less than 200 obviously, for just guys that you could pick up for spots because they wanted the opportunity. So live events, could, which is what not only tours behind your record, gains your following in your local markets and trains your wrestlers on the job training – but could actually be shot for DVD or for live streaming and remonetized, and at the same time could actually either break even or make a little money with good, strong local promotion behind it off a local TV show. And they liked that, and eventually all that didn't come to pass, but they bought the company. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and and that's the I, you know I even ha- I had workshops with the TV stations uh, in. Richmond and and over in Charleston, West Virginia, and I think some some place in Ohio, I can't remember, but they would call the sales teams together, and I'd have workshops with them to tell them how to sell wrestling, and the likely suspects in their towns. But remember, even going back before Sinclair purchased the company, we had to make these changes because we were doing shows that were videotaped, and we were doing a television show of a fashion on HD Net, and they couldn't. Look for that as a sample and see, you know, you can't sell a sponsorship to a regional fast food franchise and have guys beating up women adjacent to their kids meal commercial. And you can't have barbed wire crucifixions coming out of the goddamn, you know, local Fox News, six o'clock news or whatever. 
so a lot of that had to go, and I thought the positives of the Ring of Honor talent and their roster and et cetera were, were more than enough to carry the thing. But a lot of some of the guys that felt put upon because I didn't love their gimmicks or they didn't fit the thing we were trying to do, uh, you know, don't like me. But I was playing chess, and some of them were still playing checkers. But some, some of the guys got it, and they could be stars in any environment, and they could step up, and they could produce – through athleticism and personality and, you know, and I've, I've mentioned some of them so often, but Adam Cole, I don't mention enough just cause he was, he was one of the young ones when I was still there, but he, from the start, here's a 21 year old kid that is well-spoken and looks like an athlete and has a star quality to him and can work. He, he was a natural for this Jay lethal. Who's a big time talent anywhere. The Briscoes were unique. Davey Richards was a unique talent. He was conflicted a lot of times on what he wanted to do mentally. But physically, nobody could outperform that motherfucker. And Eddie Edwards, who I wish was still in Ring of Honor because he deserves, after all, he sacrificed for that company to to wrestle in Madison Square Garden. Uh, Because that kid was incredible, wrestling with a broken arm or a bad leg or whatever the fuck. Tyler Black, I've already said. The Kings, Mike Bennett was a star from day one. Just a lot of the Ring of Honor fans, there was that dichotomy. The Ring of Honor fans that wanted to see the guys in pajamas thought Mike Bennett was getting pushed because he looked too much like a star. And that's why he was getting pushed, because he looked too much like a star. And he was, and he was a good worker, and he was well-spoken, etc. cetera. Uh, Kyle O'Reilly worked his ass off. Roderick Strong, Matt Taven, those the guys that – had the athletic ability and didn't have to do the goofy shit or the, or the phony shit. And that's what we were trying to concentrate on. How much Uh, of a problem was Austin Aries? Oh, good God. Um, and I've told this story, but it's, it, it fits in this environment that we're talking about, but for some period of time. And of course, and Adam Pierce was booking, as I said, when I first started working with, with Carrie, and I enjoyed working with Adam, but of course he had issues with some of the office people, uh, Sid Eck and, and Ross the Merchandise Weasel, who I later had issues with. Morons. Um, and and at that, actually, I don't. I think as, calling Ross a moron is insulting to morons. But anyway, um, and Ross, as I've told the story before, held our television production hostage when Adam Pierce was supposed to be the color commentator because he, when he said he's going to beat the fuck out of me. Well, that was two years ago. How about if I say I'll beat the fuck out of you right now? Fucking idiot. Filed an HR complaint. Anyway, um, where was I going with all that? Uh, oh, Austin Aries. Uh, even before the Sinclair situation was was taking place, Austin Aries had been there for a while. I think he had left and come back. He was a, uh, the world champion when I first got there, and then he was, a, he was in the world title picture. He was a great performer, but I was told that he's always miserable, and I was told that he's never going to be happy with anything, and that prophecy came true. Uh, after a while, he wanted to transition into managing the All Night Express, Rat Titus and Kenny King, another real pip, uh, who was absolutely no help whatsoever in any way, shape, or form. Um, that Okay, that was fine, and he could cut a promo, and that was fine, but he was by $50 a night the highest-paid guy in Ring of Honor. And at the, we had to basically, about this time, Adam got crossways with the office staff, and Delirious replaced him. And Aries' contract deal was coming up or whatever, and he was not only not wanting to wrestle, he was wanting to manage, but he was the highest-paid guy in on the roster to manage, and he was knocking the aforementioned office staff that had already got Adam cut loose uh, to everybody that would listen and was doom and gloom to all the young guys about the future of the company. And so Delirious and I went to him, sat down and said, all right, this is Delirious is the booker now, and I am trying. And this was when the talks were starting to get everything on television, I believe. But I, I said, we will try to help you, but you can't go around telling all the boys that it's doomed for the future unless the office staff changes and you're miserable about this and everything has come to us and we will try to help you fix it. But you can't be telling this shit to the boys because you're making everybody want to cut their fucking wrists. Right. And his response was, they don't pay me enough here not to have an opinion. I said, okay, well we can rectify that and not pay you anything here because Carrie told me if you wouldn't agree to that, 
then you're done. And I, with pleasure, 